It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our study about the restoration of the waste places in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and in our time. Today we have the subtitle, The Reading of the Word. Jerusalem is partially rebuilt. We know the temple was ready by Zerubbabel and Joshua, and now the wall of the city is rebuilt. Security is established against the enemies. They have now an outward representation, and they can start to be the light for what God has called them to be. Their job can be partially fulfilled. Looking to the spiritually desolate place then and now, we remember that the broken families are yet not rebuilt. They still have that situation with the foreign marriages. We see that the broken society, the explosion of the poor by the rich, was restored. We saw that in the last time. They brought back peace among the rich and the poor in Judah. And then we know that there is a broken teaching and ignorance of the law of nature and of men. That's why there are so many religions. That's why there are ideologies of all kind and a science that has and is built on theories and not on the law. And this is also not yet restored. The people are not yet united. But here, our story and our lecture of today starts. And we read from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of man and woman, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Now here starts a renewal of the broken teaching. That is, the people must understand the law. And Ezra, as the descendant of Aaron from a high priest's uh, son, he is the one that is most prepared to do that. And also the Levites, and they stand on a podest so that everyone can see and hear them. And it's on the first day of the seventh month. Now understanding the feasts, we know that in the seventh month there were the three last feasts in the whole cycle of the plan of redemption. On the first of the day is the Feast of Trumpets, and on the tenth of the day comes the feasts that is Yom Kippur, that is the judgment day, the separation of the good from the evil or the evil from the good. And then on the fifteenth day it comes the Feast of Tabernacles, the joy of those who have been saved. Now we will look more to that in our next lecture. Today we want to focus on the reading of the law, or understanding of the law. So what was Ezra called to read? He was called to read the Torah. And the Torah is built out of the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. What do these books contain? They contain the God that is the creator of all things. They contain that he has built everything, he created everything by his word. They contain the creation of man. We know exactly how man was made. They contain the task, why he was made. They contain his apostasy from God and the inner change that took place in Adam and Eve when they separated themselves from God. They contain the plan of God for the restoration of the people. They contain the sacrificial service 
the sanctuary and the annual feasts. And they contain a life object lesson from the life of the Israelites. On them we have can see how they put those things into practice or not. Now, the Torah is the basis of the whole scripture. There is no writers in the Old and New Testament that does not build his writings on the Torah. So, this is a basic thing. The Apostle Paul wrote all his epistles based on the knowledge of the Torah, especially the epistle to the Hebrews, in which he explains the sanctuary service that takes place in heaven and how it was on earth, just a picture for that what will happen through Christ in heaven. So the law of God or the Torah called contains the whole plan that God gave to Moses of salvation. And it contains, as we will see later, Christ. The sacrificial service shows him from the very beginning after Adam and Eve sinned. God took the lamb and made them uh, garments which they needed. They needed the garment of righteousness. And that lamb represents Christ. So the Torah is the basics of all basics that someone needs to know. As we read in Ezra 8, we see that there were not only those who read the words, but also explained them, they interpreted them. And now the question is, why do we have to interpret words, gestures, pictures? Why can we not just take them as the information? Now, this is important to understand God created our spirit that he should be active. He must extract information. He needs information. But God, God doesn't give him an information like he gives to a robot that says, do this, do that. No, the human spirit was not made to be a robot. The body is a, is a computer. He follows exact commands, but not so the spirit. That the spirit is as dependent as the body, but the spirit is dependent on information. But in order the spirit should be active, God puts the information on a carrier so that the spirit must separate the information from the carrier in order to understand it. That's an exercise that needs efforts, that needs thinking. So, God made it so that all information, all spiritual information is transported by a carrier and that carrier is the Word. But the Word is not the information. Let me explain this like this. The Bible contains words. And the words carry an information. They are not the information. So, the Bible contains the plan of salvation, but she is not the plan of salvation. The Bible is the field in which the searcher finds the treasure, but the, the treasure is not the field. So I hope that just to read the Bible doesn't mean anything. And the best example is, the people of Israel in Jesus' time, when he came, they were reading the Torah and the prophets, but they had no understanding of them. Because you must have a capacity and a tool to extract the information from 
the carrier. So I try to picture it with trucks. So words are trucks. And they carry, as you see, an information. They carry wood locks or locks of wood. Now, the same word carries today wood. But it might carry yesterday iron. And maybe 10 days ago it carried gold. How do I know what it really carries today? You see, we have words in the scriptures. They are the same words, but they say different things in different contexts. Because they just carry the information. They are not the information. So our spirit must take the information from the words by a tool that is the law and put it on his own transportation element that is his thought. So you see, he must take and extract the information out of the word to make it his own understanding and doing then with it that what the information gives to him or carries with it. This is why it's so important to understand that learning things by heart does not help very much. So just learn by heart Bible verses. Even though some people can do that very well, it won't help if you just take the transport uh, element and just throw it through you. It doesn't touch you. If you just repeat the word, if you just repeat the words of others without they becoming your own, nothing will change. Now that's why I thank God I could never learn things by heart. I tried it often to learn things by heart. I can't. Maybe I can if I try harder, but I came to realize it is not worth it. If I put that thing, that information out of the word and put it on my own thoughts and I memorize it through my own thoughts which becomes my own words then and my own actions, that's how the word becomes internalized. That's how God says, eat my words. It's not learning by heart. You're just repeating the same words does not help as much. So let's put that together. What is interpretation? Interpretation is the extraction or the unloading of the information from the word and loading it onto the own thought. That's interpretation. And for this, you need a tool. And if your identity is I am God, then yourself, you are the scale. So you will trust your own estimation. So you say, ah, oh, this book has this length in inches or in centimeters, whatever you say. And you'll say, this is so because I know how to estimate. And then you think that you are right, that you have put the information rightly on your own thoughts in your spirit. But... How can you know that your estimation is correct? This is why we have so much confusion, confusion among the people that read the same book and they study the same lectures, but everyone comes to different conclusions. And the conclusions are not complementing each other, but contradicting each other. And in the truth, there can be no contradiction. Now, if one has the truth in his heart, the right identity, he will have the law as the measure. And we saw last time the spirit of the law. We need to understand the spirit of the law in order to interpret everything we hear, read, and taste. So the one that 
is a child of God, trusts the scale which is outside of himself. So he takes the scale and says, okay, let's see, what does the scale say? How long is this? And how wide is this? And then, yes, he has to read the scale, but he trusts the scale when he says, oh, it has this length and not his own estimation. And so everyone would come to a unity in the interpretation or extraction of the word because everyone would use the same tool. Now everyone has a different spirit. He might, since the word of God is a infinite information or you can extract from it infinite information, everyone can extract it according to his ability but they all will be in no contradiction to each other. They will just compliment. Ah, you saw that in that text. Ah, I saw this in the text. And the other says, I saw this. And then they say, wow, what a picture it gives. But none of those informations are contradictory in themselves. So in order that someone should interpret the Bible correctly, he must have the right identity. So, repeating this once again, if we are born in the unreason, thinking that I am a God, I will be my scale and I will interpret the Bible by my own subjective estimation and evaluation and the interpretation will be 100% wrong. And if I am with reason, I know I am a creature of God, then the truth is estimated, not estimated, evaluated, measured by the law of nature, and then the interpretation of the information is right. So the Bible makes very clear that I'm up to a certain point. You can understand certain things, but you will not be able to go into deep understanding of the scripture without first being changed in the heart. We find that uh, uh, Paul says it very nicely in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 14. He says this, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So, yes, until we come to a certain point, God gave us the ability to make an, an uh, understanding or a separation of what is truth and what is lie. But in order to understand the deep things of the law and the deep things that God uncovered or put into his word, you need to be known as a born-again person, one that has the right identity and starts to see things through the eyes of the spirit of the law. So, two elements must be known when we read the Bible. The law, as we have seen, that is governing the whole universe, that nothing can exist from itself, and nothing was made for itself. So everything must take in order to give. Not having the spirit of the law, we will never interpret correctly. But to have the spirit of the law, we must be born from above. And then we must know the human state of his mind at his birth. It is mostly ignored that when Adam separated himself from God, his life ended and was irrecuperable. He could not be restored. He could not be brought back except by a new life. He must be born again. He must let the old life that is dead must die. And so Jesus says in, his, in John 5, 
beautifully, verse 24, he says, Verily, very, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into com condemnation, but is passed from death to life. So we must understand we are all born death by no choice to do the right except we choose the life of Christ and become another being that is having another life. We remain humans, but we become a total new creature through faith in him. So not understanding the state of the human being at his birth we will be very confused in reading the Bible and knowing how God brought him back to be saved. So, let's look to a few examples of interpretation of the Bible through the law. We have here the Bible and we have the law. The law of cause and effect. And we must put the texts that we read either to the cause or to the effect. So, we know the cause of all evil is man that trusted Satan. And we know that the only one that can give the effect after the breaking of the law can be God because it was his law that was broken. And we understand that everyone uses God's power to do the things. God's power is an active power. So, he must coordinate that power. It's not the law that coordinates his power. He just coordinates his power through the law. In this way, God could be give, could give Adam grace. So even though he died in the moment he separated from God, his life came to an end. God postponed that until the last person will die after the final judgment. But his life is death. From that moment he ate, or from that moment he put his trust in his wife and had then to eat from the forbidden fruit. So understanding that, we will be very clear and the Bible will be a simple book. I mean, not a simple book in the way uh, that its death can be reached, but the approach is simple and easy. Well, it takes to think, but you have a tool that makes it to your spirit uh, able to grasp the deep, deep depth of God's word. So I take a few examples, and the one is the census of David when he numbered the people. When I was a little young child uh, going to school, going to high school. I always was a missionary and I talked to my teachers about the Bible. And there was a biology teacher who liked to contradict it, to contradict me. He came and said, oh, you see, the Bible is full of contradictions. And he brought me these two Bible verses about the census of David. He said, look, in 1 Chronicles 21, he says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And then he said, and look, in 2 Samuel 24, verse 1, it is said, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now it's the Lord who is against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Now, obviously, if you don't know the law, if you don't know what is cause and what is the fact, you will say, look, that's a very clear contradiction. Who now put David to number the people? Was it Satan or was it God? And if you don't know, then you will say, well, it's a contradiction. But if you know that from the cause, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David and Israel into sin. And from the effect, 
you can see from the context, the anger of the Lord is an effect. It's a, it's a consequences of what was the people did. And so he moved David. He let him do to number Israel and Judah. And he brought the disease upon them that they 70,000 in Israel died. He gave to David when he numbered the three possibilities of the effect. So we must understand we break the law, but since it's God's active law, he must give us the effect. And he can give us the effect or he can postpone the effect. He can do with the effect everything. And he only brings the effect when it is the negative effect, when it is for the good. So, we find in the Bible that Paul takes the same thing. He says, because humans have lost the, the love for the truth, God sends them delusions and wrong uh, errors. Can God send errors? Yes. As a consequence to what we do. Because he says, okay, you lost. You are the cause that you lost the light, the, the good for the truth. Now he lets all people come and you see our churches are full of people who bring all kinds of teachings and doctrines and God doesn't stop them. Why? Because if you love the truth, you will know them. And if you don't love the truth, what does it matter? You will follow the deceptions and the delusions of the wrong teachers. So let's take the other example, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. What was the cause for hardening Pharaoh's heart? It was his inborn error. Pharaoh was born with that error and he brought him to the place where he could not change anymore. And now God gave him evidences of his power and God hardens Pharaoh's heart as a result of his unwillingness to change. So God can give and must give every effect. Another thing is the incarnation of Christ, his death. Why did he need to come? Why did he need to become human? Now, if we understand that the life of man is not recuperable, he cannot be restored, he can only be recreated. So, because of the human error that we all, all are born in it, Christ had to take that on himself as a cause. That's why he had to become human. And God puts in Christ, the error and the result of it, to death. That's why God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That is, he reconciled humanity unto himself. So, the cause of his incarnation of his death is the error. The effect brings God upon his son so that he might take that off. Now imagine that you read certain Bible verses and you switch and you interpret something as a cause which explains an effect and you interpret as an effect that explains a cause. Would that not be a difficult thing? This is why the people in the time of Jesus, they had the Torah but they did not understand it. They read it day and night. They knew it. Some knew, might have known it by heart. They knew the prophecies. They knew the sanctuary service. They knew. And yet, Jesus tells to them in this chapter of John 5, he says, you search in the scripture, but you don't come to me to be saved. Why? 
because for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Christianity is today so confused because they say, oh, this, the Old Testament or Moses, oh, no, that, that's, that's the old covenant. We put that aside and we take the new ones out. Now, friends, if Moses wrote of Christ, then of what covenant did he write? Paul shows that the old covenant or the new covenant, he knows how to separate them. If you don't define them, you don't know what you speak about. But for Paul, it was very clear. The new covenant he took out of the Torah and explained it in his Hebrew, uh, in his letter to the Hebrews. Because Moses wrote on Christ. And now comes even more clearer saying, but if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So Christians read the New Testament thinking when they read the New Testament, they know it all. No, you cannot understand the New Testament if you don't know the Torah. You cannot. Because the New Testament is built on the Torah. And since we are, we are living and we are we are here to bring the work of, of God to an end. We know that God gave a prophecy for our time. He says before the end comes, he will send Elijah. Yes, it says here in Malachi 4, Read 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. But you know by which Bible verse, by which words this is uh, written? Let's look to the verse before that. Verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the stages and judgments. And now, he says, behold, I will send Elijah. So it is not possible to finish the work, to rebuild the spiritual waste places of this earth without understanding the Torah. Without understanding Christ. Because you will never understand the plan of redemption. You will not know why Passover, why Jesus needed to die here. And, and all the prophets he sees will not be able to be discerned without the basic understanding of the law that God wrote to Moses, the five books of Moses are the most fundamental things. If they are not known, you can forget the whole Bible. But Christians do this. They, it's like if the Bible is a whole as a word of, of God, then it is like the human is a whole and they, they say, okay, the liver is not important and maybe we don't need one kidney with one it's enough. That doesn't go, that will not work. And one last Bible verse from Luke 24, 25 to 27. Then he said, and this is Jesus unto them. It's after the resurrection of Christ. They, the two disciples from Emmaus are disappointed. And Jesus met them, meets them on the, on the way. And he asked them and they explained their unknowledge. And then he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And Moses was the greatest and the first prophets of all. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, where did he begin? At the Torah. Because that's the first thing. 
and first things come first. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, they had the whole, whole Old Testament with all the things, the things concerning himself. The one that don't, don't understand the Bible and separate the old from the new. I must tell, have no idea. Because they ignore that the whole Bible is about Christ. It's about his salvation to us as men. So we must rebuild the waste places, the unknowledge in the, in, the, in the people of God must be changed. In Nehemiah's time, they reached it. And we'll see in the next hours more of it. May God help us to understand the things and know that we need to know the whole picture. And the Torah is the basics of basics. Amen.